Today, it's impossible to think about evolution without also thinking about genetics. And that's because we now understand that evolution is based on the inheritance of genetically encoded traits. However, this wasn't always the case. It's a testament to the brilliance of Charles Darwin that he was able to establish the modern theory of evolution with no knowledge or understanding of genetics. The reason why Darwin had no knowledge of modern genetic theory is because no one had performed the experiments yet. That work wouldn't be completed until a few years after Darwin wrote on the origin of species. This was work performed by a monk named Gregor Mendel. Today we're going to talk about Gregor Mendel, we'll talk about his work with pea plants, and we'll talk about the results which are the foundation for our modern understanding of genetics. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. In 1859, Charles Darwin published On the Origin of Species, laying out the groundwork for our modern understanding of evolutionary theory. What's interesting is Charles Darwin explained the modern theory of evolution with no knowledge or understanding of genetics. The reason for this is simple. When he wrote On the Origin of Species, the pioneering work that would be performed by a monk named Gregor Mendel had yet to be performed. That work wouldn't be done until the 1860s and published at the end of that decade, almost a full 10 years after the first edition of On the Origin of Species had been printed. Perhaps more interesting is the fact that despite the fact that Charles Darwin and Gregor Mendel were contemporaries, there is no evidence that Charles Darwin ever actually read the work of Gregor Mendel and really never had any idea how our modern understanding of genetics would have informed his own research into evolution. In fact, no one would merge these two fields of research until the early 1900s, leading to something called the modern synthesis, or the fusion of Darwinian evolution and Mendelian genetics. This is now what we know as neo-Darwinism, or our modern understanding of how genetic material is inherited and how the exchange of genetic information and the mutation of genetic information can lead to adaptation and the evolution of species. Today what we're going to talk about is Gregor Mendel, we'll talk about his work, and we'll talk about the results of his work, which are the foundation for our current understanding of genetic theory. So first, let's talk about who Gregor Mendel was. Gregor Mendel was an Augustinian monk who lived in the city of Brno, which is in modern-day Czech Republic. It turns out that Gregor Mendel was not particularly good at a lot of things that monks did at that time. He wasn't particularly good at teaching, which was very common. It turns out he wasn't very good at monking. People didn't really enjoy his church services. But what Gregor Mendel was very good at was gardening. And he was very particularly interested in growing of pea plants. He was also very interested in nature. He was a scientist at heart, despite the fact that he really had no classical training as a scientist. And one of the things that Gregor Mendel sought out to do was to understand how genetic information was passed on from one generation to the next. All of Gregor Mendel's pioneering experiments in genetics were performed in his classic pea plant known as Pisum sativum. And what Gregor Mendel was interested in was learning how, how traits were passed from one generation to the next and whether that particular form of inheritance agreed with their current understanding of inheritance of genetic information. It wasn't called genetic information at that time, but still, that's basically what he was looking at. The, uh, the current theory at the time of inheritance was known as the blending theory of inheritance, which held that essentially genetic information was somehow transferred from two parents into their offspring, but that that information was blended together to result in new genetic information that would form that form in that particular offspring. What that implies then is that an offspring is really just the sum of two different parts that have sort of been averaged out. And another baseline assumption of this particular theory was then that that information was also lost. There was no way to recapitulate parental traits because they had been fused together and sort of uh, conformed into a new way in order to form the offspring. Now, there were several interesting ideas about how genetic information uh, was generated within individuals. Uh, some of them claimed that there were sort of vital forces that were scraped off of the somatic or body cells. Um, 
Charles Darwin had his own genetic theory where essentially um, bits of information about each individual body part um, were sort of transmitted from the blood into uh, the gametes, the sperm and the egg, and that was the information that was passed on to the next generation. Nobody really had a concept at that time of what a gene was, for example, or that DNA was the, the molecular basis for inheritance. We're about 100 years away from learning that DNA was actually the information that is transmitted from one generation to the next. But Mendel's work would prove that the blending theory of inheritance was not accurate. So before we talk about the results of his experiments, let's talk about Pisum sativum and talk about how Gregor Mendel utilized these plants in order to study the mechanisms of inheritance. First, Pisum sativum is a pea plant. Now, this is a particular plant that is able to do something called self-pollination. In other words, pea plant flowers or Pisum sativum flowers are complete flowers. They produce both the male and female reproductive organs of the plant, and they have the ability to fertilize themselves with their own pollen. Alternatively, Gregor Mendel had the ability to take pollen from one flower and transfer it to another flower to perform something called cross-fertilization. And in his experiments, Gregor Mendel would do both. And he would do this to control which individuals were reproducing with which other individuals in order to better study the inheritance pattern in these plants. Gregor Mendel was particularly interested in the inheritance of what are known as discontinuous or discrete traits. These are traits that appear to be uh, either sort of off or on. So for example, he was interested in flower color. The flowers were either purple or they were white. He was interested in pea color. So were the peas green or were they yellow? Were the peas wrinkled or were they smooth or round? These are the type of traits that Gregor Mendel studied. And he studied a whole host of them, over a dozen different traits. And the thing to note is the inheritance patterns that he got, he got for all of these traits and not just some of them. And it turns out that his data was beautiful. Some people actually argue that his data might be a little bit too beautiful to be actually raw data. But nevertheless, Gregor Mendel studied thousands and thousands of pea plants year after year and got a whole catalog of results that he would later go on to publish in a relatively obscure German language journal that nobody would read for a very long time. But that's a side note. Gregor Mendel's experiments looked somewhat like this. He would start off with what were referred to as pure breeding parents in the parental generation. The parental generation is typically abbreviated as P with a little zero next to it, P0. What I mean by pure breeding is these are plants that, for example, if they had purple flowers, they would always produce plants with purple flowers no matter how many times you reproduce them. If they produced white flowers, then they would produce white flowering offspring all the way down the line. In the first generation, what Gregor Mendel would do is he would take pollen from either a purple flowering plant and transfer it to a white flowering plant or take it from a white flowering plant and transfer it to a purple flowering plant to promote fertilization. It turns out it didn't. he did it both ways. It doesn't matter whether the pollen comes from the white flowering plant or the purple flowering plant. And this is the same for all of the different traits, whether it's pea color or so on and so forth. This is what is referred to as cross fertilization. That generation would then go on to produce seeds, which when they were planted, he would then look at the next generation and see what the inheritance pattern looked like. This second generation is known as the first filial generation. It's the first generation of offspring. You can think of it as the children of the parental generation. And what was particularly interesting was that when he took these cross-fertilized plants, every plant in the F1 generation had purple flowers there were no white flowering plants. This outward appearance of this particular characteristic is known as its phenotype. We'll contrast that in a little bit with an organism's genotype. It's what the genes say. The phenotype is what the output is, what it appears to be. And every plant produced through one of these cross-fertilization events would end up with purple flowers. Now, first and foremost, we need to recognize that even in this first generation that we're looking at, this first generation of offspring, the blending theory of inheritance has already taken a severe body blow because the blending theory of inheritance would state that if you take a purple flowering plant and mix it with a white flowering plant, those two traits should blend together 
to yield a light purple flowering plant, or like a lavender flower. None of that was observed. So already, you're starting to see that the blending theory of inheritance is falling apart. Again, I must state this happens with every other one of these discrete traits that he looked at. But even more interesting was what would happen when he examined the F2, or the second filial generation, the grandkids of the original parent generation. To produce the F2 generation, he allowed the F1s to self-fertilize. He allowed them to pollinate themselves. Now, the thing you need to understand is even though this is self-pollinization, it counts as sexual reproduction. There is still a fusion of gametes that leads to reproduction, just like would happen in any other sexual reproducing species. The results of this were even more interesting because when he looked at the flower color of the F2 generation of the grandparents of the original cross, what he observed, it was a three to one ratio of purple flowering plants to one white flowering plant. So three purples for every one white, or a three to one phenotypic ratio. That's how we word that. Again, this was true for all of the traits that he observed. And it was consistent. No matter how many times he did the cross, no matter how many, no, no matter whether it was the white pot white flower in the original generation pollinating the purple flower or the purple flower colon, or pollinating the white flower in plant in the parental generation. It didn't seem to matter. He got a three to one ratio over and over again. And this is the final death blow to the blending theory of inheritance. Because remember, the blending theory of inheritance clearly stated that that information is not conserved. What you have is the recapitulation of one of the ancestral traits. You end up seeing that, oh my, there are white flowering plants. Remember, there were no white flowering plants in the F1 generation. They all had purple flowers. So what that means is somewhere there was genetic information that contained the ability to produce white flowers that had been conserved or hidden in the F1 generation that remained left over from the original parental generation. The blending theory of inheritance stated that when, when material was inherited, it was blended together and not conserved. It was destroyed. What Mendel found in these very simple yet elegant experiments was that the blending theory of inheritance didn't hold water at all because traits were not blended together to yield some sort of intermediate phenotype. And that information was not destroyed. It was conserved. Although some of it may have been hidden in the F1 generation, it was still there. And the result of several years of experiments looking at thousands and thousands of pea plants and over a dozen different characteristics of these pea plants, Mendel was able to formulate four laws of inheritance. Now, I don't necessarily like the use of the word law here because if you've watched any of my videos about uh, science, you'll know that biologists don't really write laws. Laws are really reserved for the fields of, of mathematics and physics in the world of science, but they're still known as Mendel's laws of inheritance. And we'll learn later on that most of these are actually broken now that we've actually understood a little bit more about genetics than we did back in the 1860s. But let's talk about Mendel's four laws of inheritance. Mendel's first law states that things are inherited in pairs, that each parent passes on one piece of genetic information for each characteristic, and that two copies of each trait are present in the offspring. Now, Mendel would never have used the word genes. We now refer to this as the law of pairs of genes because the term gene had not been coined yet. Remember, there was no knowledge that DNA was the genetic information. But Mendel was spot on because we now know that in most sexually reproducing species, the adult or the, the generation that inherits the information is diploid. It contains two copies of each chromosome. In your body, you have two copies of each gene, one from your mother and one from your father. And the same goes for almost all sexually reproducing species. The second law was Mendel's law of dominance. Mendel states that within this genetic information, within this hereditary information, as he worded it, some traits can dominate over the others. This explains what he observed in the F1 generation. Mendel posited that some plants, we now know all of the plants in that F1 generation, contain two traits, one for purple flower color and one for white flower color, but that the purple flower color dominated over the white flower color and therefore controlled the phenotype. It controlled the outward appearance of that trait. Now, one of the things we'll learn is that while in some cases, complete dominance does work. 
that many that are so there are some traits that are completely dominant over others. But we'll also learn that this isn't strict. That in some cases, certain traits are not able to completely dominate or dominate at all over other traits. Mendel will refer to the traits that were able to predominate as the dominant traits and those that will remain hidden as the recessive traits. And we still use those terms today, dominant and recessive. For example, in human beings, the brown eye color tends to be a dominant allele. It predominates over all others. So for example, if you have one trait for brown eye color and another trait for blue eye color, you will have brown eyes. You'll have the brown phenotype because it is a complete dominant uh, trait over the blue eye color trait. Mendel's third law was the law of segregation. Since each parent had two copies of each trait, it could only pass on one of those traits to the subsequent generation. But what Mendel stated was that it was basically random luck which of these were passed on. There was an equal probability of inheriting one or the other trait from the parental, uh, from the parental generation. We now understand this a lot better. And the reason for this is the process of meiosis. We now understand that Although adults are diploid, possessing two copies of each chromosome, the process of meiosis, or reductive cell division, yields haploid gametes with only one copy of each chromosome. And we also know that the process of meiosis is very good at shuffling genetic information in that random assortment during meiosis one, uh, uh, during metaphase one of meiosis means that any number of combinations are possible and that through sheer randomness, one copy, either the parental or the maternal copy of the chromosome in either parent is passed on into that gamete. In other words, this still holds up. The law of segregation basically states that genetics is nothing more than probability. And we still understand this to be the case. So what that means is we can actually use mathematical operations to predict the probability of inheriting a trait or a combination of traits. Very commonly, we use two mathematic principles to help predict the possibilities or the probabilities of inheriting one or more traits. The two major rules are the product rule and the sum rule. So let's start by looking at the product rule. The product rule is what we refer to as the AND rule for genetics. It's the probability of inheriting this and that, or of this event and that event occurring. occurring. It's called the product rule to because to calculate this, you need to multiply the probability of inheriting one thing against the probability of inheriting another thing. So let's use an example. If you are what's referred to as a heterozygote for eye color, meaning you have, uh, for example, one gene for brown eyes, what we would call the brown-eyed allele, the version of the eye color gene that produces brown eyes, and one copy of the blue eye color allele, the version of the gene that leads to the production of blue eyes, you are a heterozygote. If you have one copy of the blue-eyed allele and one copy of the brown-eyed allele, there is a 50-50 probability of passing on either one to the subsequent generation. Now let's say that your, your partner then has the same, that they have a 50-50 probability of passing on either a brown eye color allele or a blue eye color allele because they are also heterozygote. So what then would be the probability of your child inheriting the brown eyed allele from you and from your partner? Well, since there is a one in two chance of inheriting the brown eyed allele from you and a one in two chance of inheriting the brown eye allele from your partner, you would multiply one half by one half and that would equal one quarter. There is a one in four chance that that child would inherit both brown eyed alleles from you and your partner. That individual would be referred to as a homozygote. They would be homozygotic for the brown eye or homozygous for the brown eyed allele. The sum rule is what we do to calculate the OR principle. What is the probability of inheriting the brown-eyed allele from you or from your partner? 
The way we can look at it is this. First and foremost, we need to look at them as mutually exclusive probabilities. They're either going to inherit a brown-eyed allele from you or from your partner, but not both. So first, we need to utilize the product rule. The odds of inheriting a brown-eyed allele from you are one in two. But since we want to know whether or not it's just coming from you, there is a one in two chance of inheriting the brown-eyed allele from you, and then a one in two chance of inheriting the blue eye allele from your partner. Multiply those together, and you get a one-fourth, or one in four possibility that you are the one that passes on the single brown-eyed allele. There's the same probability of inheriting the brown-eyed allele just from your partner and not from you, because there's a one in two chance they get the brown-eyed allele from your partner, and a one in two chance they get the blue-eyed allele, in that case, from you. One half times one half is one quarter. But since we want to know whether they get the brown-eyed allele from you or from your partner, we add those together. One fourth plus one fourth equals one half. In other words, if you were to have a child with this person, and you were both heterozygous for the blue and brown eyed allele, there is a one half chance that your child would have exactly one brown eyed allele. Now, those sum and product rules are very helpful, particularly when we're calculating the probability of inheriting multiple genes. But a very simplistic way of actually representing these mathematical operations is the use of Punnett squares. So here's an example of a Punnett square where we talk about Mendel's original experiment with the purple flowers and the white flowers. Now, one of the things we have to understand is that if we have a pea plant that has one purple uh, flower allele and one white flower allele, out, the outward appearance of that plant, the phenotype is going to be purple because purple is dominant over the white allele. So what we're looking at is a cross between two heterozygotes, each one possessing a single copy of the purple flower allele and a single copy of the white flower color allele. What we do by using the Punnett square is to represent this probability of inheritance graphically. So the way you do this, the way you construct and the way you function, you flow through a Punnett square is like this. So for example, if we look at the first box, where in the upper left corner, where you can see that there is the purple allele, the dominant purple allele, and the dominant purple allele coming from each parent, you can see that you fuse those together, and that would be homozygous dominant. Of course, that's going to have a purple flower color. If you move one box to the right but stay in the first row, you would bring down the recessive white flower color allele from this plant, from this particular parent, and move across the dominant purple flower color allele from the other parent. The result is a heterozygote with one copy of the dominant purple color allele and one copy of the recessive white flower color allele. Of course, phenotypically, that flower is going to be purple. If we move back to the left column but drop down to the second row, the lower left-hand corner of this square, we are going to drop down the dominant purple flower color allele from the uh, top parent. And then we are going to move across the lower, uh, move across the, the recessive white flower color allele from the other parent. You see again, just like we had in the upper right corner, in the lower left, we have a heterozygote. Of course, the phenotypic appearance of this would still be purple because there is at least one dominant purple flower color allele. In the final box at the lower right, we move in two recessive white flower color alleles. This is the homozygous recessive offspring. There is a one in four chance then of inheriting both recessive alleles, which means that there is a one in four chance that an individual, this is the only individual in the offspring population that would have the white flower color allele. Note that this is an exact model of what, Darwin, or of what Mendel observed in the F2 generation. And this is exactly why. The cross-fertilization event that occurred between the homozygous dominant purple flowers in, and the homozygous recessive white flower colors in the parental generation resulted in a completely heterozygous F1 generation. They all had a single dominant purple flower color allele and a single recessive white flower color allele. The end result then were all purple flowering plants.
but they were all heterozygotes. And then when the resulting plants were able to self-fertilize, they performed a mini Punnett square inside of them. And the end result was a three to one ratio of phenotypic ratio of purple flowering plants to white flowering plants. However, if we looked at the genotypic ratio, if we looked at what the genes say, mathematically, we would be able to find out that about one quarter of those were homozygous dominant. One half of the offspring in the F2 generation were heterozygotes and one quarter were homozygous recessive, a one to two to one ratio. So you can see how Punnett squares are able to help us perform these mathematical operations and predict at least, uh, at least predict what phenotypic ratio we should expect. This is the calculated phenotypic ratio. The experimental phenotypic ratio then is what you observe when you actually do the crosses. Time and time again, when Mendel performed these experiments, he got almost a perfect three to one ratio in the F2 generation, a three to one phenotypic ratio in the F2 generation. Getting to Mendel's fourth law. The fourth law was the law of independent assortment. What Mendel basically said is that the information that controls one characteristic is inherited independently of what happens with another characteristic. Using humans as an example, this would basically state that the genes you inherit for eye color are inherited independently of the genes that occur uh, that would control, for example, whether or not you had a widow's peak. Basically, what you inherit in terms of genetic information, the different characteristics are all inherited differently. So you could have brown eyes and a widow's peak or blue eyes and no widow's peak or blue eyes and a widow's peak and brown eyes or no widow's peak because that particular information is not interdependent on each other. One way to analyze what might happen in a in a in a what we would call a die hybrid cross where we're examining the inheritance or the potential inheritance pattern of two separate traits we could use a die hybrid cross and we could use a larger punnett square the big thing to realize is when we set up this die hybrid cross we must now account for all potential inherited traits on each axis so just like we had for our four square Punnett square, for our mono hybrid cross, where we're only examining the inheritance of one trait, we now need to, we need to actually quadruple the size of this Punnett square. Because if you look at the first parent, so for example, we are going to, in this particular example, look at the inheritance of two different traits, P color and P texture. Now, what we've done in this particular Punnett square, if you look at it, on top we have the first parent. But because these parents are both heterozygous for either yellow pea color or green pea color, or round peas or wrinkled peas, we need to account for all possible combinations because the law of, because the law of independent assortment states that they are inherited separately. So you can see what we've done in, uh, on the top axis. You can see that in the first square, you have the dominant alleles combined. In the next column over, you have one dominant and one recessive trait being inherited from that parent. In the next square, you have the first one being recessive and the second one being dominant. And in the fourth square, you have both recessive alleles as represented by the lowercase letters. And the same is happening over on the left or the Y axis. And now what you need to do to fill out this Punnett square is what we did in the first one, except it's just a little bit more cumbersome. We're going to bring down one of each allele as stipulated uh, across the top axis. And then we're going to bring across one of each allele as stipulated from the left axis. So what you should have is two copies of each gene or two pieces of genetic information for each trait in each box. So a total of four letters. Now, what's, what you have to remember is we're assuming complete dominance in this Punnett square, just like we did with the first one. If you look at an individual who has even a single dominant version of a particular trait, then phenotypically they have the dominant phenotype. If they have if they have two copies of the recessive trait, that is the only way in which they could have the recessive version of that particular trait. Now you can see that this is a completed Punnett square and you can take your time and work your way through it. 
realizing that according to this, the yellow P color is the dominant trait and the round P texture or the smooth P texture is the dominant trait there. If you examine all of these potential offspring, 16 potential possibilities genotypically, what we're interested in is what is the phenotypic output. When you have a dihybrid cross like this with two parents who are heterozygous at both genes, you will end up with a stereotypical nine to three to three to one ratio. That means nine out of 16 offspring will phenotypically have both dominant traits. In this case, yellow peas with a rounded pea shape. You will have three, uh, three out of 16 each will have one or the other dominant or in recessive traits. So for example, they might be yellow peas with a wrinkled texture or green peas with a round texture. And then one out of 16, only one out of 16 will actually have green peas with wrinkled texture. That is the double homozygous recessive. The reason why we can do a dihybrid cross like this is because genes are inherited separately. Genes typically, and we'll get to a few exceptions in a little bit, don't dictate what happens at other gene loci or other locations on the chromosome. Now, as you know, rules were meant to be broken and Mendel's laws are no exception. And as we learned more and more about genetics and the patterns of inheritance, we learned that not everything that Mendel said holds up. Not all of these laws are absolutely consistent. So for example, Mendel's laws state that there are two pieces of information inherited for each particular characteristic. We now know that this isn't necessarily the case. There are lots of traits that are, are a function of polygenic inheritance. In other words, there are multiple genes that contribute to the phenotype of a particular characteristic. Classic examples in humans include skin color and height. There are multiple genes that control how tall you are. When you're dealing with a polygenic trait, it actually looks very similar to what you would predict from the blending theory of inheritance. For example, they tend to be inherited on a bell curve shaped inheritance pattern. If an individual is born to a parent who is six feet tall and a parent that is, that is five feet tall, it's perfectly normal for them to be somewhere in between, somewhere between, somewhere between five, four and five, nine would be about where you'd expect them to land in terms of their final height. And some of that depends on um, which gender they are as well. Same thing is true of skin color. Somebody who is born to parents of very, uh, one parent of very dark skin color and one to very light skin color tend to have a almost, uh, on average, a, an intermediate phenotype as a result. This is not the result of the blending of genes, however. It is the result of multiple genes functioning in concert to control the outward appearance of that particular characteristic. This is again what is referred to as polygenic inheritance, but it does violate Mendel's concept of two genes Per characteristic. Mendel also stated in his law of dominance that one version of a trait is able to dominate over the other or others. And it turns out that that's not always the case either. There are two different types of, of, of dominance that we observe very commonly in living things that aren't the result of complete dominance. The first example is known as incomplete dominance. Incomplete dominance happens when neither allele is able to dominate over the other, and in fact, they sort of share the phenotype. The result of a heterozygote inheriting two different alleles with incomplete dominance is an intermediate phenotype. Here's a Punnett square showing a combination of uh, red and white flowering plants. These are both homozygous. And what you can see is in the F1 generation, when a completely red plant is crossed with a completely white plant, you end up with all pink flowers. But in the next generation, if you take the heterozygotes who are pink, you are gonna get a one to two to one phenotypic ratio of red flowering plants to the intermediate pink heterozygotes to the uh, homozygous white flowering homozygotes. This is because when you have incomplete dominance, you end up with an intermediate phenotype. Unlike in complete dominance, a heterozygote has a pronounced phenotype. It is distinct from those that are homozygous for the are homozygous for one phenotype. There is no complete dominance here. Another example 
of non-complete dominance is called codominance. The best example I can give you for codominance comes from the human ABO blood grouping. ABO blood groupings have to do with a carbohydrate that's expressed on the surface of red blood cells. People who have type A blood or who have the A allele produce the type A carbohydrate or the A antigen. People who have the B allele produce the B antigen on the surface of their blood cells. And people who have the O allele produce neither the A nor the B. Now, there are two types of dominance actually occurring within the ABO blood grouping in humans. First off, A and B are completely dominant over O. So if you are heterozygous and have one A allele and one O allele, you simply have type A blood because all of your red blood cells are going to have the A antigen. If you have the B allele and the O allele, you have type B blood because you produce the B antigen on all of your red blood cells. However, if you have one A allele and one B allele, you're a heterozygote, you have AB blood. You produce both the A and the B antigen on the surface of your red blood cells. This is the example of codominance. It's not incomplete dominance because in incomplete dominance, they would have to merge together to form some sort of intermediate of like type C blood or something like that. That doesn't happen. With codominance, both phenotypes are present in their entirety. And that is the case with the AB blood grouping. People who have both the A and the B allele have type AB blood. The only way to end up with type O blood is to have both O alleles and be homozygous for the O allele. The interesting part in how this ties into blood groupings is the fact that people who produce the A or the B antigen automatically produce an antibody against the other. If you have AB blood, obviously you can't produce any antibodies, and therefore you are the universal acceptor. You can accept blood from people with type O blood, type A blood, or type B blood, or type AB blood. However, if you were type O, you were the universal donor. And the reason why is nobody produces antibodies against your blood type. You have no antigen. Everybody can take your blood. On the other hand, you can only receive type O blood because you produce the antibodies against type A and B antigens and will attack it, which can cause you to become sick if you receive the wrong type of blood. The law of independent assortment has also been broken, and this is broken in the case of linked genes. Linked genes are genes that are physically close to each other on the chromosome, and as a result, during the crossing over that occurs during prophase one of meiosis, those genes tend to travel together during these events. As a result, they actually don't independently segregate and they tend to be inherited as a single unit. For example, when we talk about eye color, eye color and hair color tend to segregate together. So that's why it's most common to see people who have brown hair to have brown eyes and people that have uh, light colored hair tend to have light colored eyes. Those genes are actually kind of fused together. So if we were to do a dihybrid cross for linked genes, what you would, instead of seeing the nine to three to three to one phenotypic ratio that you would expect because of independent segregation, you would actually get something much closer to a three to one ratio where both traits are inherited together. In fact, it's actually a common way to look for whether genes are linked in various species is to perform a dihybrid cross and see whether you get a nine to three to three to one ratio or something closer to a three to one ratio. There's also a phenomenon called incomplete linkage. And with incomplete linkage, the, the genes are relatively close, but not so close that they're completely linked. And instead of getting a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio in a dihybrid cross, or a 3 to 1 ratio in a dihybrid cross, you get somewhere in between. And that would give you the clue that the genes are somewhat close to each other physically on a chromosome. That's how genetic mapping actually works, and that's how early experiments in trying to figure out what chromosomes were structured like were performed back in the early 20th century. The final thing we'll talk about are sex-linked genes. Sex-linked genes are those that are contained on the sex chromosomes. In mammals, these are the X and the Y chromosomes. I want to refer to them as sex-linked chromosomes because one of the things that we'll learn is later on in this course is that not all forms of sex determination are occurring through X and Y chromosomes in the living world. There are lots of different ways sex is actually determined. In some species, it's actually determined by what temperature the egg is actually incubated at, um, which is way different than uh, what we see in most mammals.
We'll stick in this explanation to using X and Y chromosomes because this is what we're most familiar with, but just be aware that the principles outlined here are consistent in all sexually reproducing species, um, but they may not be using X and Y chromosomes to accomplish this. Sex-linked traits are those that are included on the X and the Y chromosome. For the most part in mammals, and particularly in humans, these are going to be things that are found on the X chromosome. The main reason why is the Y chromosome, which is only found in males, is sort of a runty little chromosome without a ton of information on it. It doesn't include a lot of stuff. It's just some male-specific parts uh, that are uh, needed to masculinize the body. Now, the reason why sex-linked traits are of particular interest is because of the or they have a very unique inheritance pattern. The reason why is in males, those genes that are found on the X chromosome are present in what are called a hemizygous dosage. See, women, genetic females, I should say, inherit two X chromosomes. And on those two X chromosomes, they're able to be either homozygous or heterozygous for various alleles. And this is good because there are disease-causing alleles present on X chromosomes. So, for example, traits for hemophilia, which is a blood clotting disorder, and colorblindness are commonly found on the X chromosome. However, these diseases are significantly less common in women. And the reason why is these are recessive alleles. And even the presence of a single non-mutated copy is enough to compensate and prevent the diseases from manifesting. So if a genetic female inherits one normal copy and one disease-causing copy, they will still phenotypically be normal. However, if a male inherits a single disease-causing copy, a single hemophilia allele or a single colorblind allele, they have no compensatory good chromosome because they don't have a second X. They only have a Y, which doesn't include the same information. And as a result, are much more prone to developing these sex-linked traits, such as hemophilia, and colorblindness as a result of this hemizygous pattern of inheritance. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We talked about Mendelian genetics. Now, there's a lot more to our modern understanding of genetics. Nevertheless, it's Mendelian genetics that provided the foundation from which we began to understand how inheritance worked. It was Mendelian genetics that was fused with Darwinian evolution in the early 20th century during the modern synthesis that brought us what we now know as Neo-Darwinism. It helps us understand how genetic information is passed from one generation to the next and how these traits, these beneficial mutations that have begin to accumulate in a species actually do so. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you've learned a lot and I hope you tune into some future videos of mine. Thanks so much and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.